episode 15, The Paradox. Welcome to The Paradox with your attending, Dr. Eric Larson. He is a practicing anesthesiologist and clinical assistant professor at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Listen in as he takes you behind the scenes of what practicing medicine in today's ever-changing world is like with another doctor. The Paradox is a fun and accidentally informative show for physicians, patients, or anyone who has ever found themselves in a waiting room. Welcome back to The Paradox. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Larson. If you're a returning listener, thank you so much for returning, and thank you for recommending the show to your friends and colleagues and family. Today, we're going to be changing gears again a little bit, and then I'm going to be talking to Dr. Amaryllis sanchez Wolliver. Great name. Anyway, Dr. Wolliver is a family physician in Florida, and she does coaching and lots of talks. She's written many book, books. She's written blog posts on physician burnout and strategies to treat this. She's actually worked as a coach with physicians as well. And so she has a lot of ways of addressing burnout, why it happens. And in today's discussion, we're going to go over all those things. We're going to talk about the strategies for fixing it, sort of her approach to coaching, and practical solutions for how you can help your friends who may be dealing with these problems. Or if you yourself are having these problems, sort of where to turn. There are a lot of resources that are mentioned in the show. We reference back to at least three or four of my episodes. Those will obviously be in the show notes page. If you haven't listened to my prior shows, really, why not? It's, it's summer vacation season. It's a great time to get on the road. And what a great way to pass the time than to listen to me in my podcast. Uh, those show notes will be on the page at theparadox.com. That's paradox spelled the same way as the show, P-A-R-A-D-O-C-S. And the show notes page will be at paradox.com slash 015. As always, if you haven't yet subscribed to the show, Find your favorite player, subscribe to the show so it gets downloaded automatically so you never miss an episode. As always, the show is free and open to everyone. The show is designed for both physicians and non-physicians to better understand what is going on in medicine, to look at problems, look at solutions, and find see if there's some way we can come to a consensus or a way of figuring out how to get our way out of this healthcare mess hole that we've dug ourselves with in this country. If you enjoy the show and you want to support it, I would encourage you to go to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash the paradox there you can become a patron supporter of the show all the money raised at this will go towards the production and the promotion of the show i greatly appreciate my patrons that i already have those who are in the eight dollar a month or greater categories will qualify for a free gift at the end of the year all you have to do is provide your address there are some additional bonus material at the patreon page that you'll have access to as I get more patrons, I'll add more bonuses. One of the neat developments of this interview was that after I was done, I was talking to my wife about one of the books that I was discussing with Dr. Wolliver. It was a book she co-authored called The Ultimate Girl's Body Book, Not So Silly Questions About Your Body, which is a book about girls and the changes they can expect with their body as they start to enter the puberty. Well, the neat thing is I found out that that book is one that my wife recommends to all her patients, so it was kind of neat to meet an author in the flesh had I only known. Well, now that all that's out of the way, we can go ahead and get on to the show. Again, patreon.com slash the paradox to support the show. Be sure to subscribe, share with friends and family. Enjoy the show. Well, welcome to the paradox. I'm here with my friend, Dr. Amarilla Sanchez Wolliver. It's a beautiful name. <laughs> Thank saying. you. But you do go by, is it Mari that you go by? I go by Mari. That's Mari. right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Dr. Sanchez has, um, easily the longest bio that I've had sent to me. And uh, it, she's super busy, I guess is the way to put it. She's a board certified family physician. She's worked both inpatient, outpatient clinics. She's written uh, extensively. Uh, she blogs and she focuses primarily on uh, physician wellness as a vital component of the quadruple aim. She promotes and trains physicians as leaders and works to prevent burnout through education, personal and practice management support, and transforming whole life coaching. And and I'll have a lot of links to this uh, at the show notes page at theparadox.com slash 015. So I'd like to welcome you, Dr. Sanchez, or, I'm sorry, Dr. Wolliver from Florida. I, I actually go by Dr. Sanchez. Oh, there you go. Perfect. I like for my Hispanic patients to know that I, uh, you know, Sanchez probably gives it away that I speak Spanish. And, right. Uh, yes. Thank you so much for having me. I, I feel really blessed to oh. be here tonight. 
Well, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation uh, because uh, most of what I've discussed in my show, primarily what we've worked on worked on, or discussed and trying to learn more about is, is problems in the delivery system of, of medicine, whether that's the third-party payer system or the electronic medical records, drug shortages. But I have done an episode on physician uh, malpractice and through extension problems with burnout or physician suicide and depression. And I think that's a, the healthcare is not just sort of a, a system. There are obviously people who are involved in this, right? And so part of the part of the important thing is to make sure you stay well as a physician. And if you know someone who's a physician or, you know, married to them, their family members, you know, what can you do to help with, with burnout, with um, depression and those sorts of things. And so physician wellness is important because we are all people and we need to take care of ourselves. And so I thought it'd be important to talk to you since you've written extensively and given some uh, talks at Florida Medical Association, the, the uh, Florida Academy of Family Practice. You're all over the place when it comes to these things. You've written extensively in a couple of books. We'll talk about it later too. And so I guess I'd like to leave it, have you open up and just kind of describe your, um, your focus on burnout and sort of how you approach how you approach this to help physicians. Right. Well, you know, it really started with my own experience of a burnout when I was about seven years into my practice. And so um, it, I always say that my husband's call to ministry uh, saved my career um, <laughs> because right around when I was really starting to burn out in a, in a, a office, I actually really loved um, he, uh, we moved, our family moved to Wisconsin where he, my husband went to seminary. And for the first time in my entire career and really my whole adult life, I took a break. I call it, I stepped off the treadmill that had become my medical career. And so when I did that, well, we found out I was pregnant with my daughter right before we moved. And so I decided actually I would take some time off. Mm -hmm. And so doing that really transformed my life. And I, I always say that I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that it was almost like being rehumanized um, because medicine, you know, uh, how it can just take over your life in such a significant way. And our, our whole identity as physicians becomes everything we are. And so I found myself in a place uh, where I had never been um, as a person. And um, I, I spent a lot of time uh, reflecting on my life and began to uh, shift uh, my priorities. And so um, when I returned to medicine um, uh, full time initially, and now I, you know, and then I've gone part time clinically, um, I was a new person. And so I, I did things differently. And so out of that um, came my first book, which we can talk about, which was really an attempt to get doctors to do better in practice and to focus on what really matters. And you mentioned, you know, we're human beings first. And so that is really my focus is that, you know, we cannot give what we don't have. And so I encourage doctors to really kind of feed themselves as human beings first and to find a way to recapture uh, what brought them to medicine to begin with. And I find that, that really nothing re-energizes someone's career as focusing and just having that as the foundation of what we do. So when you're approaching the question of burnout, uh, and fatigue. I mean, obviously, everyone's situation is different, right? And so, what drives them to what causes the problems? And so, uh, can you kind of go over what what sort of things you see as the primary drivers for burnout for physicians questioning why they're doing it and sort and and uh, why they got involved in medicine in the first place? Because I think when you look at those, then you can sort of address those independently and then kind of figure out ways to you know fix it. Right. And a uh, great question. And that really goes to sort of the, you know, the heart of the matter, you know, so some people call it uh, the ecosystem in which we practice, right? And so that there are certainly some individual physician factors that have to be addressed. Um, <clears throat> but really, when you look at um, the problem of burnout, it's really a system problem. And so physicians are sort of the victims in the, pro in, in the process in a way, although I don't like that word. Um, really, you have to look at the entire healthcare system as sort of the umbrella that is above um, the physician who ends up being at the bottom of, of this picture that I'm going to paint. So on the top, we have this umbrella of the healthcare system that is so fractured and has isolated physicians and then um, and really devalues uh, our training, our education, our experience uh, in a way that is really unprecedented right now. Uh, then under that umbrella, you have to look at the individual 
uh, organization in which uh, physicians practice, which increasingly, uh, it's something like 70% of doctors are now employed. Again, mm-hmm. that is drastically different from when I trained 20-some years ago. Um, under that, then comes the individual practice and the practice culture where that physician is practicing, uh, which uh, you know is again a, can be a huge uh, driver of burnout. And then under all that goes the individual physician and what that one doctor can do to help themselves uh, be less prone to burnout. And so, if you don't address, you know, so it's something like more than 80% of the issue with burnout is outside of the individual physician's control. So all those layers that I just mentioned have to be addressed. Um, so that, you know, doctors will do better. And so what, what happened for a long time is that um, the individual physician would be sort of blamed for burnout when really now, thankfully, organized medicine as well as, um, you know, at the highest levels, uh, there is a growing recognition that, you know what, the healthcare system has to be held accountable for physician wellness and for um, our equipping so that we have what we need to practice each day. Uh, because no, no doctor I know went to medical school to be mediocre, you know, and that's uh, actually the number one uh, driver of burnout, um, of physician burnout, is our inability, whether it's perceived or real, to do our jobs well. And if we feel like we can do a great job, uh, we're going to be a lot happier. And if we, if we feel like we're just beating our head against a wall all day, uh, trying to take care of patients with excellence and compassion, if we feel we just cannot do that, we will not do well. Yeah, I think, I think you're right there because uh you no one goes into medicine to be um to not be able to make the decisions to help their patients and and when you have a system that you feel is working against you it it probably it causes much more frustration than any sort of other situation i mean i think in and uh if you look at other things that ways in looking at other things that occur in life the same sort of thing occurs right if you are in traffic and you're in a traffic jam nothing is more frustrating than not being able to move in your car right, right. and i think and it will drive you crazy if you spend most of your time in traffic that's never moving. And I think a lot of physicians feel that with they get into their whatever their healthcare system is, whether it's uh, they're employed or even ones who are not employed, if they feel like they're not ever making any progress and not doing what they what they were trained to do, what they want to do, that it's going to cause the most amount of frustration and it's going to cause the burnout. So when you look at, I mean, that's a that's a ton of things to unpack as far as you know how you fix this. So for the average physician, you like you said, you can't control 80% of, of, you know, assuming you can't change jobs right away, you can't control 80% of what, of what the problem is, where, you know, you're in an insurance-based system, you're trying to see patients as fast as you can, you're trying to code, you're trying to, uh, you have performance measures, you have quality measures, you've got a certain patient panel you have to see, and you have a certain amount of your referrals you're supposed to do if you're a primary care physician, and, and laboratories, and imaging tests that you're expected to, to order within the system. So how do you balance that if you're someone who just can't suddenly just go out on their own and, you know, start their own practice? Yeah. So what I do when I talk to, I talk to a lot of doctors one-on-one. And um, and so the first thing I do is, you know, just get a sense for how they're really doing, you know, and, uh, and what the, and so, you know, it's all based on what they perceive, want, and need. And so, um, so each individual physician, like you alluded to, is different and our needs are different. So, And also every specialty has unique needs. Sure. But the first thing that I typically encourage people to do is to think about the, the one change that they can make that will make a difference tomorrow uh, or pretty soon, you know? And so, and so I, I try to encourage people. So that could be for somebody getting a scribe. I mean, and that has been, you know, life-changing for many doctors I talk to. Mm-hmm. Um, or, you know, simply, um, I don't know, learning how to make templates uh, better and use them more efficiently as it relates to the electronic health record. Um, or maybe uh, it has to do with talking to their medical assistant who, you know, is not helping them be as efficient as they could be. I mean, whatever it is that they choose to act on first, what I find is that doctors who become proactive do so much better. And so, and so what I like to do is to just start with the one thing and then get that implemented and done. And that's very motivating, as we notice, you know, because burnout kind of robs your energy, your motivation, and even your sense that you can uh, bring the changes that you need. And so if a physician makes even one small change that matters and makes a difference to them, um, then they remember, oh, you know, I do have some control over some things, and let's focus on that. So that's one way that I, uh, that I like to start and has been very effective. So it's sort of like it's the old adage, right? You just clean up your corner of the world. You can't fix the whole world, right? 
And you hear people talk about financial problems. And when you talk about people trying to come out from under debt and you have 27 loans, right? You just pick, you pick one of them, maybe the easiest and the smallest one, you take care of it. And as, and it gives you, you feel empowered that you've changed your situation, right? And so it, you try not to tackle everything at once, right? So that's the first goal. So you recognize something you can do positively to affect, affect your practice. And for those who aren't aware, uh, with electronic, electronic health records, now, of course, everything you know, has to be entered in uh, manually. And so one of the big beefs many physicians have is that they sort of turn into, these, into, into clerks where you're, you're typing and doing things. You're, you're just doing a lot of clerical work, which is not what you went to school for. <laughs> and so by hiring a scribe, this is someone who nowadays, it sounds like are pretty much kids who want to get into medical schools. It's almost like a requirement oftentimes to get into med school as you have a year as a scribe who just transcribe things for you. And so that's, and of course it's an added expense, but it's one that, you know, if it maintains your sanity, it's probably well worth it. And you know, it pays for itself is what I hear over and over. And also it's a, it, it's typically a win-win because as you alluded to, often it is a medical student or somebody very interested in, you know, in medicine. And so, um, so it's great for them because they're getting to learn, you know, the soap note, you know, how we write notes um, and, uh, and how we interview a patient how we ask questions, how we kind of run through a visit. Uh, the patients love it because now they have their physician one-on-one -on -one again. And so the, the patients are actually happy. And uh, when, you know, studies have been done in the last few years, and then the physician typically is just thrilled. Um, and, uh, you know, they, then this relationship develops uh, not only between the patient and the physician, but also uh, with the scribe can be very meaningful to both. Because, um, you know, most doctors like to teach. And so, um, so it, really, it really is changing uh, changing things for the better uh, in many cases. Sure. And I mean, I guess the other person who I look at and say, well, you've added a, an extra person you have to hire. And so even though it makes you more efficient and it pays for yourself, it's only because you you have a, you were adopted a system oftentimes against your will in the sense that you got hired into a system that, that you use it or you're forced to, compelled to by law or some or by insurance payers, that you're now got a system that of course is not helpful to your, to your productivity. And so it has slowed you down significantly requiring you to have someone like a scribe. But Exactly. I, uh, <laughs> that's, yeah, but it's, it's that's one way to thing. adapt to that, you know, and, and one of the things I find that is fun is for doctors who, like, I, you know, we were talking earlier that uh, I've done some medical missions, and one of the things I love about missions in the way that I've done them, which has been overseas mostly, is, uh, is you know, we're on paper. And uh, it's really nice to be able to see a patient document really quickly what you actually need so that you can care for them. And... Um, and that's that. And so, so volunteering can be a really neat way to sort of jumpstart um, your heart, so to speak, um, when these issues are just so difficult in your day-to-day -day practice. And so that's yeah. a creative way to, to deal with that too. Well, and, and for someone listening who's not in medicine, you've got to be thinking we're talking crazy because there, there's not much in you're thinking, why would paper be faster writing something down than, than clicking, you know, three things that should be, I mean, the whole point of computers is to make things more efficient and they move and, and, you know, storing information, everything's seamless, right? Except that of course you and I both know that the problem is we're documenting things that are not clinically relevant and, and so much, and it, it takes so much effort to get just a, a regular visit um, printed out. Not because only, Not only they're not clinically relevant, but they're, you know, now you get notes that all look the same. And so um, yes. you have to spend so much time when you get a note from another doctor to find what's actually helpful, what you need to make decisions, you know? And right. so, yeah, it's, it's a, uh, boy, we could spend three hours just on that topic, right? Oh, I, and I've already spent an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and you're right. I mean, I think, you know, as someone who, I'm an anesthesiologist. And so when I have people come for surgery, I've got to comb through a three-page or four-page H and P. Right. Where, frankly, you know, most of the stuff I don't care if someone wears a seatbelt. It doesn't in any way affect you know, what what or you know what the whether you know most of their whether they have are married or what religion they have. Or, you know, those things are not in it at all any relevant at all. And so, in that case, yeah. anyway, you know, it's it, there's there's a lot of information that you just get overloaded. And like you said, it's hard to find stuff. And so I. I know people find that hard to believe. I mean, it's all there, but it's sort of like if you put my birthday and it was a 100 page book, I said, my, well, my birthday's in that book. You just need to find it. Well, that's, <laughs> it, it comes very, very frustrating for physicians. Right. So um, when you're, so when you're dealing with burnout, you have people who, who then get the first step where they, they um, 
they fix, they get a scribe or they fix something. How do you, uh, how do you continue to that momentum if you're a physician and to, to get to the point where now maybe things are more tolerable and, and you get past that frustration stage? Yeah. And so, I mean, <clears throat> the point, your question kind of points to the answer because, it, you know, it's about perseverance, consistency, and kind of keep at it, you know? And so, and so what I do when I, when I meet with docs is, or talk to them is to get them to write a list, you know, of the things, uh, you know, of where they are and where they want to be uh, and do that as a person and do that in your vocation and, uh, you know, in your work and do that in the different areas of life and, uh, and really kind of look in a, in a more broad way. And it's interesting when you do that exercise, you, you know, financial wellness, we talk about um, emotional relationships, all of it. And, and to really, it's very eye opening sometimes when people realize, you know, if I, if I grow or improve in, say, my uh, this particular relationship right now, it's going to help me in every area of life. Or for people whose physical wellness has just um, really uh, suffered because they've been so busy uh, with their medical life, you know, to reshift uh, and focus a little bit more on their physical wellness will have a huge impact uh, on their work life, actually, you know, sleep, I mean, so many things. So, so really, again, for each doctor, it's going to be a little bit different. And it's, it's a matter of looking at your whole life rather than just part of it. You know, work should be part of life, not everything uh, surrounding work. And so I think that's what happens to so many of us. And it certainly had happened to me, and I hadn't realized it until I stepped off the treadmill. Right. Um, and, I, and I've heard that story a number of times. I mean, not only just during these, this podcast, but also from just colleagues and people who just getting, they, they just got overwhelmed and it was hard for them to come back and, and uh, be effective. Because once you're, once you're worn down, it's hard to, be, to, hard to be a good person to be around. And, and unfortunately, as you know, if things aren't going well at home or they're not going well at work, the, the other suffers too, right? And so it turns out we don't spend 24 hours at work. And so you're, what's going on at home makes a big difference too and, and, uh, and how you deal with your family. We're whole people. We just have, you know, sometimes become a little fragmented. But one of my favorite papers that I've read, and I've read so much literature over like more than 10 years on burnout, um, <clears throat> is uh, an article in the American Academy of Family Physicians. It was written actually in the year 2000, which, um, which is fascinating because back then there weren't many, uh, there wasn't much talk about burnout. But the article is called Overcoming Compassion Fatigue. And the authors talk about three ways to prevent uh, burnout and recover. And they actually talk about <clears throat> uh, the first element of that being growing in self-awareness. You know, so as physicians to really, uh, you know, look at things in a, in a deeper way to really um, understand what's happening uh, in our lives. And then to identify what really matters to you. And so consider your values. And then the third thing would be to make sure that your life is aligned with your values so that there's congruence um, in the way you're living your life, that incongruence actually is a huge contributor to stress and burnout. And so that doctors who are unable to practice medicine in the way they really know, they, uh, you know, that's, that's why they were called to medicine. Um, <clears throat> to the extent that we become incongruent in that way, it's just a huge stressor. And so when you start aligning uh, your practice with um, who you are rather than what you're being asked to do, that can be life-changing as well. It's a great process to go through. So it sounds like it. And and when I was discussing uh, physician suicide and malpractice with uh, Dr. Jim, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with her work, and she's at thrivephysician.com, uh, which is a really interesting part, uh, website, where she she attributes a lot of problems with physicians as far as not specifically burnout, but with um with I guess internal conflicts when it comes to because of the malpractice issue and that there's. The, the issue of malpractice cases is it's so prevalent in a career physician. I think for a high, a high risk specialty, your chance of being in a malpractice suit at some point in your career is about 99%. And ah. for the low, um, the, the low risk professions like family practice or pediatrics, it's still, only, it's still 75%. So ah. the likelihood that you're going to get sued is well over half, right? And so ah. The amount of the number of physician suicides in this country, I believe it was that we were talking about is 400 a year, which is yeah. Yeah. twice a medical school size. At least, you know, my class was 200, I think. Yeah, it's outrageous. And, so. and so, I mean, her contention is that a lot of that is because of 
the stigma of malpractice and the fact that you you have to internalize it all because you're not allowed to discuss it. It's not something you you discuss with your colleagues or your family or your friends because you know you might be worried about legal reasons you can't discuss a case. The fact that I mean you you could probably and just that it's not socially acceptable within the physician ranks because you're also partially worried that you'll be judged by your colleagues. Absolutely. And, you know, that's a great, great point. And there's uh, some resources that I share with uh, physicians. Uh, one of them, it's called the Schwartz Center. Um, I think it's right. the Schwartz Center that, that or you've heard about that. Well, um, there, I've heard of Schwartz Rounds where you were yeah. sort of a closed door, but um, but it does involve non-physicians too. And so some people feel it's not quite as effective as if it was just physicians, but yeah. It, it does. It can involve the whole team. And then the second resource is called Finding Meaning in Medicine Groups. And I don't know if you've heard about that, but I've participated in some and helped facilitate them. And that is a physician-only um, group that comes together. Uh, it's usually something like 10 to 12 doctors that will meet in each other's homes and they will um, you know, talk about whatever... Uh, topic they choose. They could talk about empathy. They could talk about, you know, malpractice risk, uh, but typically it's going to be something that's, um, that is, um, uh, going to be very helpful, uh, to them. And what happens is these groups of doctors, uh, start to relate on a very human level, uh, that's very vulnerable. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, they begin to develop a great deal of trust with each other. And so they can be very, very powerful, uh, groups for doctors to do that. I've had a number of uh, people who are listeners who've reached out to me who are married to physicians or are uh, intimately, in, you know, they know them, they're either close family members or friends. And um, what would you tell them as far as, because, you know, often I, no one's going to walk up to you and say, boy, I'm really burnt out, right? <laughs> no, it's not a term. It's a term we use, but we don't actually ever use to describe ourselves. Maybe others, I suppose, but um what what would advice you give for for those people? And you know, how do you help someone recognize these things? Uh, you know, what do you do for them? Um, so yeah, the first thing is is recognizing it, right? And so typically you will have, and it's interesting. It affects women and men uh, physicians differently. Of course. Uh, in the, in the sense of uh, typically for women, uh, the first thing that comes is sort of a loss of meaning and purpose, uh, a sense that you're really not contributing or making a difference in people's lives. Whereas for men, typically they will get cynical, they will get negative, uh, they will get, um, uh, you know, just angry, and it'll be just more those types of emotions. Uh, and, uh, you know, still might feel like they're doing an awesome job, uh, uh, they may or may not be, you know, and so, um, so those are some of the things, but, you know, this culture of medicine of, uh, you know, often the nursing stations will be uh, places where um, there's a lot of inappropriate jokes that are, you know, maybe made about patients and, and uh, comments that are made that are uh, cynical. Often it's actually signs of burnout. And, uh, you know, sometimes we come to think of it as almost normal, but it's really not normal. It's yeah. a sign of, uh, of, you know, you're just not doing well because we all, you know, typically people who go into, into uh, healthcare are compassionate and are not going to make comments like that if they're at their, at their best. And so those are some of the things that you can see that, that will point to, you know, a sense of depersonalization is the other, is the mm -hmm. other um, criteria we look for for burnout. And there's actually a mass lack burnout inventory that uh, people can take. And there's so many uh, websites now where you actually can go and do it and see whether, you know, where you fall. Um, and then it's a matter of, um, you know, again, just kind of stepping back and, uh, and really looking at your life uh, with some honesty. And uh, sometimes you need help from someone else, you know, whether it's a colleague, whether it's your supervisor, another physician, sometimes it's a counselor, sometimes it's a pastor, sometimes it's a coach. Uh, but, you know, reaching out to someone, um, I think is my message. You know, I want, I want every doctor to have somebody they trust and will talk to, uh, that they will say the truth, that they will say, this is how I'm really doing. Um, help me, you know? And, uh, one of the things that is a pet peeve for me is when I hear, um, I've been in practices where everybody's pointing fingers at somebody who's not doing well, mm -hmm. but nobody has reached out to them. And so what, so what I hope to, you know, when I talk to, to groups is to um, ensure that everybody realizes that, you know, we're all in this together, uh, be, you know, uh, caring for the entire team um, uh, and caring in particular uh, for the physicians who, um, unfortunately, the media and our culture 
uh, is so negative about doctors uh, because mm -hmm. there's so many misconceptions out there. And so those are some of the things that I've become such an outspoken advocate uh, for doctors because we go through so much sacrifice. Um, you know, we sacrifice our use. We go through, uh, take on enormous debt uh, to do what we do, and uh, and our society is devaluing us, and so um, so I just one day I just said, you know what? Um, it actually it actually started with a conversation I had with someone, and they were uh, saying some negative things about a doctor that may or may not have been true, and I finally said, you know what? That's my colleague you're talking about, <laughs> and um, and I have not stopped talking since then. <laughs> yeah, so. So it'd be just so if you're if you're just if you're suspecting your spouse or your you know your cousin or uncle or whatever, I guess the thing is to be empathetic, right? I mean, I suppose whenever you start a conversation about somebody you think has a problem, you don't go go up to them and confront them and say, "I think yeah. you're suffering from burnout," right? It's yeah. it's sort of how's things going, and boy, it sounds like it's pretty rough out there. Is it is it is it a challenging at your work? And then I probably at that point people open up at some at, on some level, right? and say, oh, yeah, the patients are driving me crazy or the administrators or whatever. And then you can sort of as well, have you thought about trying to, you know, look for look for someone to help you maybe solve a couple of those problems, right? Is that sort of how you'd approach? Absolutely. And I mean, I think it's also knowing, you know, the right time to bring something mm -hmm. up and sure. then how you bring it up. I love how you put it, uh, how you might approach someone. But I think it's all about, you know, trust, um, friendship, relationship, you know, which is why, um, one of the ways that we can change the culture of medicine is by having a sense of family where you are, you know, and so that we, uh, to the extent that we start caring for one another and, uh, you know, maybe going up to someone who's not having a great day and asking that question, like you just said, you know, uh, and then observing, you know, are they consistently uh, new behaviors, you know, where somebody really seems to be going, uh, you know, kind of spiraling downward or is it just a bad day, you know, and, and approaching it that way. I had a, I have a great story that I sometimes share uh, when I was having a bad day at work. And, um, and, you know, those mornings when I was just going from room to room and, you know, it was just not going great. And so one of my MAs um, who knows me well uh, <laughs> saw me and she said, hey, Hey, Doc, how you doing? And I said, oh, you know, I'm having one of those days. And she actually said, um, she said, hey, um, let me show you something. Come here for a minute. And she pulled me back to uh, our charting area. And she actually just played a song for me. And because she knows me really well, she knew that that song probably would help me. And it did. And it's a good thing that I stepped off the treadmill and just spent a minute and a half listening to a song because about an hour later, a patient came in and she had lost a loved one. And so she really needed me to be fully present with her, to be very empathetic. Um, and uh, I was able to do that. And I think, uh, I wonder if I would have been able to do that as well, um, had I not taken a moment to get myself centered again, you know, and it started because a, a co you know, a, a coworker who knows me well, trusted our relationship enough that she could come up to me and say, hey, how you doing? What can I do? And so that's what I mean. Yeah, right. A practice uh, significantly. So you, we touched on earlier in the conversation um, the factors that lead that lead a lot of these physicians. I mean, I think in general, just feel the feeling of of helplessness and that you're not able to get to do what you want to do and practice the way you want to practice. Uh, and then, and then with anesthesia, we we all we are very concerned because uh, substance abuse is something that's real is real. I mean, I had um, a. a a kid who was a couple years ahead of me in residency who ended up uh, overdosing on medication. He was using some stuff at home just because it's so prevalent. Um, I don't want to say substance abuse is prevalent in anesthesia, but the access to medications is there all the time. And so if you start having problems with burnout and, and uh, you can get yourself into trouble in a hurry. I mean, everyone has, everyone has access to alcohol at home and that's certainly a, a substance that's more the most heavily abused, I'm sure of any, you know, with any sort of profession, but um those are the th those same those things you mentioned where people withdraw on personality changes, things that just practicing differently. That's those are the warning signs you have to look for. But for people who can't, um, who who can, let's say, what do you? How do you recommend they change the way they they approach, or maybe they change jobs, right? Because it sounds like in on some level you just stepped away and then you went back, but you're probably more careful about so what practice you went back to and how it works and operates. Oh, what yeah. sort of things do you think is important to prevent burnout from occurring in the first place? Oh, that's a great question. And um, 
And that's a lot of the conversations I have actually right there because so many people are wanting to switch jobs. And so the first thing I always say is that um, something like 70% of people who come to someone uh, to help uh, if they're burning out or burned out, um, about 70% of them, if they start working with someone who will help them, um, can keep their job, can stay where they are and actually optimize that that job situation. Now, mm-hmm. um, that's probably not going to be the case if, um, you know, usually most doctors who quit their jobs, they leave because of their supervisor, their immediate supervisor, who's typically a medical director who was burned out. And that's how they went into administration <laughs> to begin with right. because they never dealt with their own burnout. And they figured, hey, if I stop seeing patients and I do more administrative stuff, um, it'll be great. And so they don't have a full understanding of what burnout is even about because they never dealt with their own. Mm -hmm. And so so that's important to recognize. And um, the other reason doctors quit is if they feel like they, uh, yeah, like they don't have control over things. And so, so that's important. But the first thing I have people do is actually write down what is it you want? You know, consider that. Take some time to reflect and to really grow in self-awareness. What, what does the job that would be like a dream job for you, what does that look like? You know, wh- how much are you making? What kinds of patients are you seeing? You know, are you outpatient, inpatient? Are you, you know, all of it, write it all down and really get a strong sense of what it is that you actually would love to be doing. And that process, as you start working on it is actually very empowering and it helps people dream. And I'll say, you know what, don't think about whether it's possible for you. Just write it down. If it's something you've loved, you've wanted to do. And when I actually started that process, I actually met with a coach myself before I became a coach some years later. And, um, and I did that. And what happened at that point for me is that I had always wanted to write. And so actually within a year and a half, of me going through coaching, I wrote my first book and I haven't stopped writing since then. And so, you know, the process really gets you to kind of reawaken dreams and to begin to use gifts that, you know, in medical school, so many of us have different talents that we don't even use anymore because, you know, we're studying all day yeah. Yeah, and caring for people. Right. And so, so that's what I, part of what I do is try to reawaken um, some of these and it, it is uh, it's really actually very exciting to see it happen um, I have a I have someone right now that I'm helping a physician and she's in a different state and um, and we had one conversation I mean pe- some people are just ready you know mm-hmm. and so we had one conversation and suddenly you know like there's been job interviews and you know she I mean, things are changing drastically in such a short amount of time. And so um, sometimes you just need someone who helps you believe that you can change things. Um, and and that's often what ends up happening. Yeah. And and I would say just for myself, I think, you know, I, I was listening to a number of podcasts um, and and I was inspired to do this, right? And so it's actually been a great experience for me because I always tell people that in medicine, you don't really create much very often, right? And so... And I have, um, unfortunately, I have no artistic or musical talent. Uh-huh. And, um, so I, but I can talk. And so I thought maybe I could just do this because I think provide an, you know, an interesting voice in medicine and to try and, to try and bridge the, the understanding between physicians and, and the lay public about right. what's going on in medicine. Um, and so that's why launches and it's probably why you write books, right? I mean, those, those are the things that probably we need to when you're in medical school, as you said, you are so focused on getting through your um, pathophysiology exam and your immunology exam, and then you're on your rounds. You 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 know you talk to people what books you read, and it's they're never books outside of medicine, yeah. right? Yeah. right? And it's not until after you finish residency, almost that you say, oh yeah, I can sort of rejoin the human race. What happened the last eight years? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. And that's exactly what happened to me. But I have to tell you, I, you know, I was so excited to discover your podcast because um, I just love having a physician doing it, you know, and I am so eager to have um, the public understand um, how much really what they want is what we want. I mean, we're really partners yeah. and we just, we, we just have lost that. And, you know, it's not that we've lost it, it's that all these other people um some of whom are really not needed are in between us and our patient. And what we want is to go back to that. Yeah. And so, um, so I'm just very excited to have, uh, you know, physicians doing, you know, things like your podcast and other things and all these groups that are, you know, um, that are starting and, and um, growing of physicians coming together to make a difference and to, 
you know, to take that patient-physician relationship and put it back in the center where it belongs. And that's what we want. And so, um, so it's very exciting. Yeah, you're, you're very diplomatic how you put people who are not important. <laughs> we, it's, a great, well, you know, it's a great euphemism. We all know who we're talking about. Uh, and so, you know, I've, I've interviewed a couple of direct primary care physicians, and, and I would say for sure, direct primary care is not the answer to everything. Sure. Uh, there are a lot of struggles that people go through, and I think it's, there's a, there are tremendous challenges that go, th- go with starting your own direct primary care practice. Um, but it, it, it is a way of, of, move, re- of removing all those op- a lot of those obstacles, I should say, that, that are between you and the patient. And, and even if you're, whether you're a specialist like me or a primary care physician like my wife or like you, I think that the relationship you have with the, the patient, whether it's brief, and and transient like for me, or if it's a it's a sustained one like for you or my wife, um, that's really what what drives most people in medicine. I mean, I know they're the people who are the technicians who want to just do their their you know procedure, yeah. but if you don't have that um, that human contact at at some point that's meaningful, it the job becomes really it well it becomes a job. I mean, I, I feel like many times I don't feel like I'm working, and I feel. I don't feel guilty about that, but I mean, I really enjoy um, what I do, it, but it's nice because it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel onerous. Like if I was just doing some other, something I didn't want to do. And so I've considered myself lucky in that sense. Yeah. And I wish, I wish everyone felt that uh, in medicine. And I know that we all start out that way, or at least that's our vision of what it's going to be like. And so. Yeah. Um, I, I love what's happening with direct primary care. I actually have a good friend um, who is in Washington, D.C., and uh, she practices in uh, DPC right now. She's become very vocal about the change, you know, that, um, you know, uh, she gets to do house calls. You know, I loved, I did a house call the other day, which was so cool. I, I <laughs> went and gave someone a shot, and I thought, oh, this is so great, you know. <laughs> you went and gave uh, someone a shot. It was cool. <laughs> it was cool. It was very cool. So, so I, you know, and I love it. I mean, I just love when, when I get to be part of watching uh, a physician bring change to their own life, you know, so that they um, they go fulfill what they feel they're called to do, you know, and yeah. uh, and it is a, about relationship for many of us. Now, for some, you know, hey, if you're great at procedures and that's your thing, well, go and do awesome procedures and do a great job, you know, be excellent at that, you know, that's cool. And uh, hopefully, you're you know nice to the patients. Um, and uh, yeah, but I, I think for most of us, you're right. What drove us into medicine is, is uh, the patient physician relationship. It's so special. Right. And I, I, I always go back to it. And I don't know if this is, maybe I'm imagining this, but the sort of the Norman Rockwell painting with the guy, you know, the doctor wow. sort of, the boy, I think it's hurt his knee or something. And he's sort of, you know, and there's clearly that, that personal sort of touch that's involved. Yeah. So I I've looked, I read an article the other day that, that referenced that um, painting and actually blamed it for the fact that telemedicine is not taking off as fast as people thought. And, uh, and so I thought that was really interesting. And I think you're right. Um, that, that, you know, that painting, uh, paints a picture of what we all long for. Yeah. I, well, I don't think there's any question. And, and I think uh, as a physician, you probably go in thinking that's what medicine is. At least, you know, you understand the different specialties and obviously not all going to, you know, be doing house calls and stuff. However, you expect that medicine is that way and your, your role may be a little bit different, but I think the thing that we forget all the time in medicine, I know I'm this way, is I forget what it's like to be on the other side, right? And it's not until I encounter the healthcare system from the other side, which fortunately I've been very healthy. Uh, but, you know, I've gone with my wife's had things happen and we've gone in for things and for my kids or whatever. And you start seeing the part of the healthcare system that really doesn't work very well. And, and it lacks that sort of personal touch. And you realize how that... How is a patient? The patients wanted as much as a physician, if not more, because healing is not just a it's not a it's not a scientific thing. I mean, we 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 rest on the fact that our that our trade is science based, and it is. But ultimately, I mean, if you want to get down to the, the reality of it, we can't do anything because the body has to heal itself. Mm. We all we can do is set up the conditions for success, but the body essentially has to do the work. Mm. Lovely. I, you know, there's science and there's art. Yes, right. But I, I agree with you, you know, and, and actually I, I uh, became a patient a few years ago. I fully recovered, thank God. But, um, but yeah, it, it was extremely eye-opening. I mean, medicine is not what it was when I trained. 
uh, 20 years ago. I was, you know, really blessed to go to a tremendous uh, community um, uh, hospital where, where I did residency in family medicine, and it was really outstanding. I mean, it was such a great place. And, and now uh, that I see some of the changes and um, I, I think back and I, and I feel like, wow, um, thank God we have a lot of doctors out there who uh, care about a very high standard of care um, and uh, are fighting to make sure that that, that prevails uh, because there's so many competing priorities right now. Uh, you know, there's 70 uh, or there's um, there's 10 administrators, non-clinical administrators to every one physician now. Um, and uh, that is an outstanding, uh, uh, an amazing thing to, to be aware of and uh, what's happening um, as a result uh, that, you know, physicians have less um, of the decision-making power uh, and, uh, and it's changed, it's changed things dramatically. Right. And, and I think if you look at an, another place in in our society where you see the same thing, and you see that in higher education, right, or the education where you so you, you see a tremendous, probably more in higher education where you see a tremendous explosion of people who are not associated, not in, affiliated really with the t- deliverance of education, <laughs> who yeah. are now in these universities, and you see the same sort of result, right? You see exploding uh, costs in both healthcare and education. Uh, where I'm not sure who's in the lead as far as inflation, <laughs> whether it's healthcare or or higher education, but they're both far outpacing uh, normal inflation. I want to touch real briefly on your books, and you've written three of them. I see, yeah. right? Uh, so you have obviously faith is important to you. You've walking with Jesus in healthcare, uh, the three whys of faith, and then the ultimate girl's body book, the not so silly questions about your body. Body. I kind of like to ask you just a question or two about that book because it sure. is that. Um, I assume that's for puberty, right? Is, is yeah. that sort of the, as the body changes? It sounds like that sort of book. Is that? Yeah. So, you know, so it's a book to really address uh, the main questions that girls uh, in their tween and teen years would yeah. ask uh, about their bodies, about friendship. Um, we uh, touch on, you know, many, many different topics that are very common to girls at that age. And um, I have some neat stories of reading stories from it uh, during sleepovers in our house. <laughs> <laughs> you so, read about puberty? <laughs> Well, you know, there's, uh, maybe not some of the topics, uh, but you know, certainly chapters on friendship and uh, less threatening uh, issues. Yes. <laughs> right. Well, and I'll tell you one story that I had that it was totally unprepared for. So my daughter is now 16, but when she was a brownie, I think I was at my wife's um, clinic. And so she was showing the girls, um, they're in these small groups. And so they, she show them different stations. There's like a first aid station. She shows them first aid stuff. They made a cast for one of the girls or a sling or something. And so my role was, I was going to have them come into one of the exam rooms and I'd show them how to scrub and sort of like talk about the operating room, you know, since obviously we can't take them into the operating room. And these are cool. probably nine or 10 year old girls, right? Or maybe even eight, maybe it's like eight or nine, I think. And so we're, I'm showing them how to scrub and putting gloves on a mask and hat or whatever, and having them put on, you know, some as well. And then, and then I would say, well, you know, their parts of medicine is not like this clinic where you're actually in the operating room and there are people who do surgeries. We do surgeries on the on brains, on hearts, on bones if it, they break, oh and maybe your your tummy, and even like even you know even do uh, even do things with babies. And one of the girls like, "What do you mean?" I said, "Well, there are you know surgeries for babies uh, that, that we do babies, and sometimes we need to have surgery to have a baby." And not and right that was a. <laughs> <laughs> What do you mean? <clears throat> where, where do babies come from? Suddenly, I was, oh my gosh. I was down. A, I was down a long ways down a road. I did not want to. <laughs> I did not oh, want to awesome. be on. So somehow I got out of that. I can't. <laughs> I started talking about brain surgery that's or something. Right. But Beautiful. That was a, yeah. That was a, a dangerous sort of thing. So that's the kind of book that. So your book though is one. So you'd want to get for for the girls. Is yeah. that the kind of book that you'd say we just like leave? I mean, I've heard lots of parents say, "Well, I just have these." books on puberty i just kind of leave like just randomly leave them around lying around so make they it grab- almost seem like they're not supposed to find it but make sure they find it right that's funny um you know this one uh, uh because of the way it's written so that the earlier chapters deal with the uh, with the less um difficult topics you know but then as the as the book goes on we, we do get into you know the topic of sex and yeah uh, and other things and so what i recommend is that is that the parent reads it first, you know, sure. and, uh, and that they, you know, they give it to, um, 
to their girls in an age appropriate way based on their level of maturity and that some of the chapters they can maybe read together and uh, and to just tell them you know you're gonna have questions come up please ask me the the cool thing is my daughter and her friends know they can ask me anything and so it's it's really fun um, to have that kind of a relationship um, and you know they still get embarrassed about some things but uh, in general uh, it's uh, it, it's led to some great conversations and and so um, does it mention how girls are really mean in school sometimes oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> that's good oh, that, that's- was, that was the most distressing for. I think there are more tears shed over mean girls uh, and just that something that randomly happens than any sort of other problem that we've had. Middle school, middle school can be tough, you know, but yeah. it does get better as they continue to mature. So yeah, no, I There's absolutely. Hope. And it's, it's actually, I mean, if you're a parent, the, the neatest thing about the whole thing, aside from it, I mean, it does go very quickly and suddenly you, you just suddenly see a kid who's four and your kids, your youngest kids, maybe 10, you're like, whoa, I was there once, you know? And right. we got a tantrum. I'm glad I'm not dealing with that. Of course, you're dealing with bigger and more expensive problems. Is kind of what happens. But it is neat watching the kids as they develop and um, they sort of they grapple with things and they cause tremendous amounts of frustration. I don't know. If you, um, but you know, there's obviously you watch them turn it into a young adults and then eventually adults. And there's and a lot of lives. You know, it's it's very interesting seeing them develop. Yeah, it is. It's fun, and you know, there's um, it's wonderful to. Uh, now we have a college student in our, uh, mm-hmm. we have three kids and one of them is in college and just seeing them uh, grow and, and remembering, you know, how, how they were when they were little. It's a, uh, what a tremendous gift really. Yeah. Uh, children are. So, yeah. So uh, we'll kind of wrap it up around here. I really appreciate the discussion. If people want to find out more, um, what's the best way to find you? Um, probably through my website, which is, uh, I think you're going to post, right? It's faithfulmd.wordpress.com. Mm-hmm. Sure. One of these days I'll, I'll shorten it. Um, <laughs> I actually bought the domain years ago and I just have never transferred it. But anyway, uh, that's probably the best way it's through the contact me part of my website. And if they look up my name, actually, you know, you know, that my articles and different things on my website will pop up. It turns out there are not too many Amarillo Sanchez Wolivers out there. So that <laughs> that is it. Yeah. That is a nice, unique. Unfortunately for me, there are about four or uh, five hundred thousand Eric Larsons, and so, in fact, I had another one who was a year ahead of me in middle school, and that caused all kinds of problems when I got called to the principal's office, and the principal was like, "Yeah, wrong one." And so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you say it was the wrong one, right? Yeah. Well, fortunately, what? Yeah, you know, we'll just. That's my version of the story, and we'll just kind of stick to that. Um, <laughs> That sounds good. And, and so obviously you can get your books there. And I, I will have them again on the, the show notes page for anyone to access. Uh, thank you so much for being on. Uh, and, and the other, I guess, before you let you go, you mentioned being a coach. So obviously you coach and so people could contact you to be you know, their coach to try and help with dealing with these professional issues. How does one find a coach? I mean, is this like, is this a Google thing? Like <laughs> you know, physiciancoaches.com um, yeah. or something? That's a great question, and I don't think there is such a thing. I mean, it's really still a relatively new uh, development. I think it's wonderful. Um, you know, many physicians won't see a counselor, won't go to a therapist, but they will uh, see a coach. And so um, so it's a tremendous uh, opportunity. You know, uh, the physicians that I've been able to help uh, in this role um, – are so grateful. I mean, they they just say, I'm so, you know, they basically tell you, I've never had someone sit and listen to me talk about me for an hour, you know? <laughs> and I mean, it's a wonderful thing. And I just feel so privileged, you know, yeah. uh, because really my heart is for my colleagues uh, because of the sacrifices that we have uh, been through to, uh, to try to do an excellent job at something that we're extremely well-trained to do and our society is just not valuing or really knowing uh, what it's really like for us. And so what we really want is to, is to do what's best for them. And really, by and large, um, really every physician I know um, wants, that's what they want. And so, um, so I feel it's a real privilege. But yeah, so um, there's not that many of us out there. Um, and I don't, I don't really coach that really very many. I mean, I, I, I only will coach one or two people at a time. Um, and that's just the way I do it um, because I want to be able to go deep. Uh, so i think there are groups out there that you know it's just a lot of volume and that's just not me um did you see jerry Maguire? i'm kind of a jerry Maguire. show me the money no no uh (laughs) spending a lot of time (laughs) 
<laughs> no, I just want to go deep and really. Yeah, uh, right. On sure. So, um, well, thanks again. I appreciate it for taking some time out of your evening to spend it with me and my listeners. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to The Paradox. If you like what The Doc is doing, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. And share the show with your friends. Become a supporting listener to get access to special bonuses at patreon.com forward slash theparadox. Show notes can be found at theparadox.com. <laughs>